Hi, I'm Mike from Craft Supplies USA, and today I want to show you some really exciting new pen blanks we just got in. These are the bespoke pen blanks from Hobble Creek Craftsman. Mark's done some really cool things with his casting process to get some amazing swirls and color blends in these blanks. Some of the things that the Hobble Creek Craftsman has done to make these unique is he's got some amazing swirl patterns going throughout these blanks. Um, they look pretty cool in the rough format, but once you start turning through that outer, outer layer and you get through into the middle, there's some amazing patterns and swirls. Uh, his color blends are also some of the best that I've ever seen before. And one of the other things that makes these unique as well is the rod length. These are eight and a quarter inches long, so you can get a full two tube pen and a keychain or a smaller single tube pen, or you can get three single tube pens. And these give you a lot of versatility and maximizing um, the dollar you spend on a blank. So you can get um, a matching uh, second project out of it as well. One thing I like to do with these is I'll usually turn a couple of pens out of them and then I'll turn a small key ring or a key ring lighter that you can sell as kind of a, a paired combo at a craft show. It helps sell these blanks as well. Um, but the colors he's got in these are, are quite amazing and I'm excited to show you turning some of these or turning one of these and, and going through the process. So one other thing that's nice about these blanks is when Mark casts, he gets zero bubbles in these so it's completely solid all the way throughout the blank. Um, and then he also does a vertical cast on these, so the swirling is also a little bit different than the, the standard mold um, cast process. Uh, the resin is alumilite, so it turns and polishes really easily. Um, and I'll be doing a little bit different turning and polishing process today to show you guys some different variations on how to achieve a super high gloss on acrylics as well. So let's get, this, uh, let's get all these blanks off the lathe. We'll get our blank that we want to turn. We'll drill it out, go through the turning process and the polishing process, and show you guys how cool these look. With these blanks, it's hard to pick a favorite, but for the pen we'll be turning today, this is the Riptide color. It's got some really cool swirling in it, and I wanna show you um, some different things you can do with this to make it look really cool. So first thing we need to do is cut this to length for our kit, and then we'll drill it out, um, and then get the tube glued in, and then we can start turning the pen. Uh, but first thing we need to do is get this mounted in a chuck. You can use the pin jaws, pen drilling jaws, or you can just drill this on a, or cut it on a bandsaw, and then use a standard drill press to drill that out for your tube. Um, but I'll mount that in the pin jaws, get that secured, and then I'll mark my overall length that I need for this uh, pen kit. This is the Junior Zen. It's a good size pen kit. It's nice and small, something you can carry every day, um, but it's still comfortable to write with as well. So I'm going to come in about an eighth of an inch from the end, and then I'll mark this about an eighth, sixteenth or an eighth past the overall tube length, just in case I have a blowout with the drill bit. I have a little extra material there. I can still barrel trim and have a full length tube. So once I have that marked, I'll bring out my tool rest. Give that a quick spin, just make sure it's not contacting your rest at all. And then we'll bring that up to speed. Um, for the parting process, this is running fairly true, uh, about 1500 RPM, and I'll be using my narrow parting tool to, to keep as much material here on the blank as possible. The standard diamond parting tool is about a quarter inch wide, so um, the nano parting tool is nice because it saves a lot of material when I'm parting things off like this. And then because I'm unsupported on the end from the revolving center, I'm just going to support it with my fingers a little bit as I part this off. And that's all it takes. So once you part that off, you can see once we cut into that, all the swirl patterns you get on the inside of the blank that will be revealed as soon as we start turning this down to our bushing size. So I'm pretty excited for that. Um, the nice thing too, the Alumilite turns really, really easy. Um, if you have a dust collector, most of the time it'll just pull those ribbons away from the lathe. You don't have to worry about it. Uh, but the cool thing is, so I've parted this off for a Junior Zen, which is uh, about two and three quarter tube length, three inches. So it's a, it's a fairly long single tube kit, but I still have about four inches here. I could still turn a couple small key rings or almost even, you know, a Junior Gent or a shorter two tube pen. Definitely a slim line for sure. Um, so I'll keep this aside. Um, and then the one thing I also did as well is I parted off the end I'm going to be turning right now. I left the end with the tag on it just so I know which one this was if I go to turn it later. Uh, so now that we have our blank cut to length, I'm going to mount this in the chuck again and just tighten that up. I don't want to go too crazy on the chuck pressure, um, especially if you're drilling this close to the outer diameter. You know, if you're drilling you know, a 12 and a half millimeter for a junior gent or something. If you're over compressing this, as soon as that um, is drilled out, um, sometimes you can fracture the blank actually with the chuck jaws. So don't get too crazy 
with the pressure on your chuck. So now that we have this mounted, let's true up the end for our drill bit to find the center and run true. I'll get my skew and just true up the end of the blank. This alumilite turns like butter, so very easy to cut. Once the end is square, I'll use the tip of the skew and just create a small little dimple that's running nice and true for our drill bit to find the center point so it doesn't wander on us. Let's get our tool rest out of the way. And then we'll be using a keyless chuck with an 11 30 seconds drill bit. That's what this kit in particular calls for. Obviously use the appropriate bit for your kit that you're gonna be turning. Um, remember the tip that uh, Dick Singh taught us, keep your tail stock nice and loose and advance that bit until the bit finds the true center and then you can lock that down. And then once both the wings of that brad point engage, I'll just snug up my quill just a bit, enough to where I can still advance it, but it takes the play out of that. Um, wood lays are not inherently accurate like a metal lathe, so you always gotta look for a little advantage to try and help, help them run a little more accurately. I'm gonna bump the speed down just a little bit. Make sure to clear those chips out every half inch or so. Um, with the lathe speed, you definitely wanna slow it down from your turning speed because a lot of times it's, over, it's easy to overheat the acrylic and it'll cause it to get soft and the bit um, can actually melt the, the shavings and have it bind up in there, so. Sometimes if I'm drilling hard to drill acrylics or something like a true stone, I'll actually get a little uh, squirt bottle and just spray water in there to help keep the bit cool, keep the acrylic or whatever the material is cool. When you're drilling, if you start feeling a lot of resistance, that usually means the shavings are binding up in the flutes of the drill bit. So just make sure you're paying attention to how the lathe is handling and, and reacting with the, the pressure and also the noise too. The noise will change if those flutes start getting clogged up. But once we're close to the end of the bit, I wanna slow down my rate of advance with the drill bit. Um, if, you're, if you're just cranking through there, you hit the end of that, it'll blow the, the back of the blank out. And if you don't have enough material, then you're, you're gonna end up with an overall length that's too short. So, Slow down once you get close to the end of the blank. All right, and we're through. I heard a little bit of a crunching noise. I think we did chip it out a little bit. So we had a little bit of a, a blowout there with the drill bit. I thought I was a little bit further away, but uh, as soon as that bit came out, it chipped out just a little bit. But because we left ourselves an eighth inch on each end, we have plenty of material to barrel trim and still have a nice full length tube. Um, the nice thing, drilling on a lathe, everything runs a lot more true and accurate than it does on a drill press. So anytime you can drill a pen on a lathe, go ahead and do it. We'll take our drill chuck out of the lathe. We'll get our four jaw chuck off the lathe as well. We'll get our, get our revolving center and I'll show you a different a method for turning a single tube pen, which you might find handy. And we're also gonna get this prepped and glued up. All right, so let's take our chuck off as well. I've recently added some magnets to the headstock to hold my chuck keys and accessories. It just keeps them in a handy place. Definitely worth looking into. All right, so now we're ready to glue in our tube. So first thing we need to do is scuff the tube, get that surface prepped for a good glue bond. Um, these tubes are pretty slick from the factory, so we want to scuff them up, give something for that glue to hold on to and bite into. Um, I think this is 220. You could go with you know, 120, 180, doesn't really matter. Just something that's going to scuff that tube up really well. Get a rag, wipe away any dust. Oils, um, you could use some denatured alcohol as well to clean the tube off. Um, but one thing I wanna show you real quick is 
when you're drilling the lathe, you get a lot more concentrical and there's a lot less slop around the tube and the blank. So you get a lot better fit between the tube and the, the material, which will prevent a lot of those um, blanks from blowing up where they don't have a good glue bond or there's a lot of voids between the surfaces. So anytime you can drill on the lathe, go ahead and do it. We'll be using some thick CA glue um, for video's sake, just to do this all in one kind of one shot. Um, but most of the time when I turn pens, I, do, I use epoxy. The epoxy is going to give me a more permanent bond long term. Um, and also it's a little more flexible as well. So once we coat the tube in CA glue, I'm going to insert that and then just rotate that as well. And then I'm actually going to take it out and do that from this side and try and get that glue as evenly coated inside the tube as possible. And then I just rotate that on the paper towel to clean off the ends. So there will be a little bit of glue in there. Um, if you're worried about that, you can use some wax sheets to close those ends off. But All right, so the CA's had plenty of time to set up. So this thing's nice and cured. We can barrel trim it now to square up the ends of the blank so our parts fit together when it's assembled and finished. So we'll get our barrel trimmer. Um, you can barrel trim. Um, I don't recommend doing it by hand. This is the way I, I personally do it. Um, but for safety's sake, if you have one of the drilling vices, put it in there or just a clamp, something to hold the tube. That way, in case this slips out, you don't, you know, you know, don't risk your hands getting cut by the barrel trimmer or anything like that, or the blank spinning in your hand. Um, but this is what I do just for speed. I stop barrel trimming once the brass tube is exposed and I've got a nice square end for those components to fit correctly into. So now we just need to do the other end. Nice thing is that Alumilite barrel trim is really easy. Doesn't take a lot of force. And then you can see that end as well, nice and square, nice good ends, ready for our bushings and our components. So I'll set my drill off to the side. And instead of using a standard pen mandrel or the collet chuck to hold the pen mandrel to turn these today, I'll be turning these between centers. So what I need to do is get my drive center. This is just a 60 degree drive center, goes in the headstock. So we've got our drive center in the headstock, we'll get our 60 degree revolving center in the tailstock, and then we'll use our bushings. Uh, this method only works for doing a single tube at a time, um, obviously, but we'll mount our bushings in the tube. And then these bushings also have a small little chamfer on there that'll register on our drive centers. Um, there are specific turn between center bushings that have a longer chamfer, um, but these work pretty good as they are. So get those mounted up on the lathe, and then we'll go ahead and snug this down as well. You don't want to get too crazy tight, um, especially if it's a really thin wall section kind of tube and blank when it's finished. Um, you can cl actually collapse that brass tube in there and crack your blank as well. So you want to go light on your pressure, enough to drive it and turn it, but not too tight to where you can damage things. The benefits of doing turn between center is it's a lot more accurate and you don't get the wobble you get on pen mandrels, you don't get the harmonics and frequency, you know, vibrations you get, um, especially on those longer 2-2 pen blanks as well. So uh, most of the time I turn between centers. It's a little more accurate for me and it's also kind of nice because I don't have to have a pen mandrel or the man or the, the collet chuck system. Once this is mounted up though, we can start rounding it out. We'll get it down to our final size. And this kit in particular is a, is a long straight kind of pen kit. There's not a lot of curvature in it, so I'm gonna keep the blank fairly straight and then we can really show off how cool the blank looks as well. So we'll get this up to our turning speed. We're gonna be about 3000 RPM. Um, the faster for these really small blanks, the better. It cuts really clean. All right, I'm gonna start roughing this out with my spindle roughing gouge. Obviously make sure you wear uh, eye protection and dust protection whenever you're turning. And we'll use the spindle roughing gouge to get rid of the bulk of the material, and then we'll go to our skew to get our finishing cuts and our finishing passes. This stuff turns very soft, turns really easy, and the nice thing too is the Alumilite's um, a lot, I wouldn't say softer, but it's not as brittle as a lot of the acrylics out there. This stuff co uh, comes off in some pretty good ribbons. So, which is handy for the dust collector because it just pulls that ribbon and just pulls it straight into the collector. 
The one downside to turning plastics is you do get these wrapping around your bushings. Kind of get in the way, you can't see your bushings very well, so just clear those off every now and again. But a nice sharp tool will definitely help. Carbide works really well on this material as well. So if you're using easy wood tools, it's a good one to do. A uh, good tool to use that with. Um, and the nice thing is too is that carbide leaves a really good surface behind, surface finish on acrylics in particular. All right, now that we're bringing this blank down, we've cut through that outer layer, um, the pattern will really start coming through and also we need to clear off our shavings. But let me clear these away and you can kind of see the pattern that we're gonna have in the finished blank here when we're done. So if I rotate this around, you can see that amazing swirl pattern we have through this. Really unique. There's not a lot of blank makers out there that have that same swirl to them. Uh, really, really good looking. The ribbons are kind of a pain because they wrap around the bushings, but the nice thing is there's, there's less dust because everything kind of stays together. But obviously you want to wear some good dust protection whenever you're turning. So let's get this going. We'll keep roughing this out with a spindle roughing gouge and then we'll get our skew out once we're close to our bushing size. And then we can fine tune the diameter a little bit easier with that. With the spindle roughing gouge, it's easy to be a little heavy handed especially on acrylics. Sometimes you're just pushing too hard and you'll get it bite in and you'll have a bunch chip, um, a bunch of the acrylic chip out. So you wanna be fairly light with the pressure. I'm not really pushing into the blank at all. I'm just letting the tool um, cut the surface nice and clean and easy. If I push into it too hard, it's not gonna react like wood does. Um, wood's a little more forgiving in that manner. So just be gentle, especially with the carbide tools as well. It's easy to be a little too aggressive with those. Um, but I don't know if you've been able to pick it up on the, on the camera, but normally when you're turning on a pen mandrel, you get a, you know, a decent amount of vibration and harmonics. Um, but with the turn between centers, you really don't get any of that. And then it's a lot easier and there's less flex and chatter. And it's just a more enjoyable turning process. So if we take a look at the surface that we have, Spindle roughing gouge leaves a, a very smooth surface with a sharp tool. So that looks pretty good. Now we're about, I don't know, 16th or so, maybe a little less than that away from our final diameter of the blank down to the bushings. So I'll remove just a little bit more and then we'll go ahead and switch to that skew. I feel like my tool rest is just a touch high. I'm going to drop that down a little bit. And while we're just patiently turning this down, one thing I want to talk about for a second um, is the lathe height. We don't really talk about this too often, um, but you want that spindle height to be basically, if you have your elbow bent, basically where your elbow is, it keeps that at a more comfortable working level so you can turn longer and be uh, less tired and sore after as well. Um, if you turn on a lathe that's a few inches too short, it's really uncomfortable because then you're kind of leaning over and you get a little more stiff. So um, if anything, I'd rather have the lathe be a little bit higher than my elbow than be too low. And again, we're at about 3000 RPM. The faster you can cut acrylic, the better. So go as basically as fast as your lathe will let you turn. Some of those mini lays will go up to 32, 3400 RPM. Just clear away those shavings so we can see our bushings. All right, we're getting pretty close to our bushings. Now we'll go to our skew to get our final size. Nice thing about this is it's super controllable and because I'm using it like a negative rake scraper, it doesn't self feed. So it allows me to be very controlled with my cuts and it leaves it behind a really good surface as well.
And then I want this blank to be pretty much straight. If you wanted to throw a, you know, a convex shape on it, go ahead. One thing I like to do when I'm trying to get something completely straight, um, especially with a skew like this, is I'll come from the back side of my blank, and then I'll put my thumb on the tool, and then use my right hand here basically as a stabilizer guide to work on a nice transverse across the tool rest. It helps me be a little more steady and controlled than just being back here, trying to keep that consistent all the way across. It's easier to kind of anchor my one hand on the back side of that blank and then just go back and forth. The nice thing about the skew like this as well is it leaves behind a very clean surface. We can start sanding with 320, 400 instead of the, you know, the 180 or the 220. And you always want to get a really good surface off the tool. It's going to save a lot of time and money on sandpaper and just sanding time in general. Sanding for me is probably the least enjoyable part of the process for turning. So anytime I can reduce that, I'll try to do that as well. So, um, What I'm looking for right now is just to be slightly proud of my bushings. That way when I sand, I'll be right at the bushings. And it's just enough to where you can feel your nail hit the edge of the blank to where it's slightly proud, um, but not much more than that. And then the other thing I'm looking for right now is to leave almost a perfectly straight and smooth surface. So if I fill the blank, this part feels really good. I'm just a hair over the bushing, so I'm right where I want to be. It's nice and smooth. And then I can fill some tool marks right here, so I'm going to refine this surface just a hair. And I'll check my bushing diameter, and that's basically right where I want to be. So we're done with the tool. Now we can start sanding this and getting this perfectly straight and ready to polish out. And I also want to take a look at the pattern we have. So you can see we've left behind a really good surface off the tool. Um, there's no, really no tool marks. If you feel them, you can feel just a little bit of a ridge here or there, uh, but that's pretty good for what I need. Um, but you can see the swirling and the color marbling we have throughout the blank is really, really good looking. So um, as far as the sanding process goes, I think I'm good enough to start sanding here with 400. Um, we'll give it a shot, and if it doesn't look like it's removing enough material or smoothing out as efficiently as we want, we'll go, we'll go back down to 320. But I'll move my tool rest out of the way. Whenever you're sanding, get your tool rest out of the way. That way, just in case something gets stuck, you don't have your arm over a tool rest. Um, that could lead to an injury or something like that. So get things out of the way just in case something does catch. There's somewhere for it to go. All right, and before I start sanding, I just want to get rid of all these shavings. These things get a little bit of a static charge and they stick to your clothes and it kind of drives me crazy. So I'm just trying to clean this off and get this ready to sand. All right, so I'm going to start with my 400. Whenever I'm sanding a blank like this, especially where it's basically going to be straight across and no curve to it, uh, make sure you grab both ends of the blank I'm going to drop my speed down as well. A 1500 RPM. 3000 is a little bit too fast. Um, it generates a lot of heat on the blank and the paper. It destroys your paper really fast, as well as the blank can actually distort depending on the material it's cast from. So you want to slow that down. And the biggest thing too is when it's going so fast, the sandpaper really doesn't abrade the surface very well. So By pulling this across with two fingers, it evenly spreads out that pressure across the paper and gets rid of all those ridges or any undulations in your surface. You can see the sandpaper loads up a little bit. Just give it a flick. Then you can keep sanding. If you want to wet sand, go ahead. Wet sanding is a good way to keep that dust down as well and it keeps the blank a lot cooler and helps the, the paper cut more efficiently. All right, so I'm just feeling the surface. I'm gonna stop the lathe, take a look and see if we've got rid of those ridges we had. 
feels pretty smooth. I think there's there's just a tiny ridge right here in the center. That 400 is really not cutting it. So I'm gonna go down to my 320. We'll see if that 320 is going to get rid of that ridge. Feels like it's getting flatter, so that's good. Okay, we got rid of the ridge. Now it's nice and smooth. Now we can go back up to our 400. All right, that feels pretty smooth. So the next step, um, as far as the blank prep, so for the polishing system, we'll be using this Magic Juice. It's a six-step polish, um, but the preparation is really key in having this work the way it's supposed to. And so once we've sanded this smooth with a 400, I'm gonna go and sand this in a crosshatch pattern. So I'm sanding diagonally, so I'm going from the headstock, kind of across and over towards the tailstock. And then I'll do the same thing from this side towards that side, creating an X pattern basically on the blank. That gets rid of all those radial scratches and that'll give us a really good prepped surface for the polish to really do what it's supposed to do and get that really high shine we're looking for. I saw this sanding technique done by an auto body specialist guy. Um, they were correcting some paint on a car and they said sanding across in an X pattern helps get rid of um, those blemishes to where they can polish the clear coat out a lot better. So. And I say, if it's good enough for a Lamborghini, it's probably good enough for a pen blank. All right, once I've sanded the entire surface in that cross pattern, just double check it for any radial scratches that were left behind. All the scratches I can see now are in that X pattern we have from our 400. So let's go up to our 600 now. And when you're talking about polishing acrylics or really any finish on materials for that matter, all we're doing is looking to increase the optical clarity of the material. So the better you can polish it and get rid of any imperfections in the surface, the more it'll be allowed to shine, get a higher gloss, allow more depth for the colors in the blank, um, especially on something like Diamond Cast where it has those little flecks of diamond in there. If your blank's not properly polished, they won't shine the way they need to or could look. So getting the you know correct polishing procedure in place and getting your getting your own way of doing things dialed in is really what's going to make those blanks pop. So once we've sanded that with the lathe running, we'll do the same crosshatch pattern here on this with the 600. But I'm just loving the color swirls and the depth we have in this blank. We did the same crosshatch pattern kind of sanding on that CA project handle video we did. And if you haven't seen that, we can, you know, you can check it out on our channel. That was a good CA video on how to do it on a project handle. Some tips and tricks there as well. And if you guys have any questions on polishing acrylics or anything like that, drop them in the comments below. I read all those comments myself and answer them directly. So if you have any questions on any of the videos, just leave it in the comments. We'll get to it. All right, now that we've hit that with the 600, I'm gonna wipe this off, get all the dust off, and just inspect the surface really well before we move up to a finer grit. So we're right at our bushing diameter where we need to be. That's what we were looking for. And I don't see any radial scratches. Those radial scratches, now that we're moving on to finer and finer grits, those never come out. They'll always be there if they're not being removed by the current grit that you're on. So if I'm sanding scratches and they're not coming out with 600, drop back down to your 400 and see if they come out and if they don't, go back down to your 300. Um, but if you see a scratch in there and it's not coming out with the current grit you're using, it'll always be there no matter how much you polish it with finer grits. So take your time. All right, so now that we've done the 600, I'll do the 1500 Merlon. This is a non-woven pad. Um, it reduces the risk of radial scratches a fair amount because it doesn't have a a standard grit pattern on it like paper does. And then being 1500 grit, it's gonna refine that surface even more. 
And these can also be uh, used wet sanding as well. They stay together. They don't come apart. So, all right, I'm just going to fold this in half and then we'll do the same cross hatch pattern that we did with the four and the 600. All right, now that we've sanded that with the 1500, let's move up to the 2500 grit. Same thing. It's kind of repetitive, but that's what it takes to get the job done correctly. So I do want to point out, however, with the 2500 grit, after you've done the crosshatch pattern, you don't see visible scratches. And these blanks, I did one of these um, with a matte finish, and it was one of the first acrylics I've seen that actually looks really good with a matte finish as well. Um, it was the same blank, and the kit I used on had an antique finish, so it had a matte, you know, all the parts and all the components were matte as well. And the blank looked really sharp with a matte finish instead of a gloss. So one thing to think about there, Sometimes a matte finish on those antique platings actually looks really sharp. Um, if you don't have the Merlon pads in the 1500 and the 2500, you could start out with the micro mesh pads. Um, the first couple are right around that grit range. You could use those as well. Um, but the benefit of these is they don't have the standard grit pattern on them. So they help reduce some of those radial scratches you get. But those micro mesh pads work as well for the first couple grits. Um, steel wool, also you could use steel wool. I don't know if it's going to be the same grit range, you know, if you're at a 4 out steel wool, but it's worth a shot. So I honestly, this as a final finish, if you wanted to go matte, that actually looks very sharp. It's perfectly smooth. There's no scratches that are visible and it looks really good, especially with the antique plating. Um, but as far as our final polish, what we'll use on this is the micro, or sorry, the magic juice, the six step polish. Um, there is a, a little caddy for these available, and I threw some magnets in mine just to help prevent it from, you know, getting bumped off the, the lathe bed too easily. So we'll run through this. Um, the first thing I'll put on it, though, is the scratch-free. I find between that 2500 grit Merlon and the first step in this, the scratch-free kind of has a good little spot in there as far as the grit range on this goes. So we'll hit it with the, uh, sorry, the scratch-free first, and then we'll go through our one through six. All right, now that we're polishing, we want to bring our lathe speed back up to our turning speed. So we're right about that 3000 plus. And get enough friction where you can feel some heat, but not so hot you can't keep your finger there. And then we'll get a clean rag and buff off the scratch free because now we're going to be moving on to finer grits. We'll get a clean section of paper towel and I'll be using the first step. Just give that a good little shake before you use them if it's been sitting for a while. And then we put just a tiny little amount of polish on the rag. Um, these small squeeze bottles could probably do 200, 300 pens with these. So they go a long ways. I know the whole kit's fairly expensive for a polish system, but you can do a lot of pens with these. I can already see the gloss level. If I'm looking over here where the gloss from the lights are coming in, um, the gloss from that, from the scratch free to the first step has come up probably three times as much. And then I'll put just a tiny bit more on and just do one more pass with the first step. And then we'll get a clean section of rag and then buff off any of that polish. And then we'll go to a clean section again and do the same thing and work our way through all the grits. And even going just from that first step to the second step, that gloss just keeps bumping up every time. And then a clean section again, just buff off any of that polish. Again, just enough friction to get warm, but not so hot you can't keep your finger in place. And then a clean section to buff that away.
put just a little bit too much polish on the rag. Grab a new piece of paper towel. All right, so we're on step five of six, and that finish is looking incredible. Super high gloss. One of the funny things as I'm buffing this out is normally my last step for any acrylic is to use the acrylic buff. That usually gives me the highest gloss I can get. Um, but I did one of these with the Magic Juice, and then I buffed it after, and the, the acrylic buff actually dulled the finish. So I was really surprised at how high gloss this got. It's the highest gloss I've ever seen on acrylic. So I've kind of switched to this as my go-to for acrylics. But yeah, give it a shot. I think you guys will like it. And then the last step, the number six, is kind of watery, so be careful when you start squeezing that out. Sometimes a lot of it comes out too fast. But now we're on our last, the sixth and final step. And this will just leave an absolutely mirror polish behind. And then we'll buff that last polish there with a clean section of rag. And then we'll stop the lathe and show you guys just how glossy the surface gets. So you can see now that the surface is polished, we have a lot of depth in the colors, a lot of sparkle that we didn't see before when it was matte. And I'll take this off the lathe and rotate it around a little bit so we can see in the light. So we have a mirror polish on there now, and you can see just how much depth there is in that blank and the swirling is just amazing. So super happy with how this turned out. All right, so now that our blank is turned, we'll get our lathe bed cleaned off get all of our uh, pen kit components out here and our pen press, and then put this thing together. I wish I could show you guys this in person because the gloss is just off the charts. It doesn't really show through with this blank color being so light, um, but if we did a, you know, a black blank, it would show off the, the gloss a lot more, but it's, it's extremely shiny. And if I hold that up in the light, there's no scratches or anything visible on it. So super happy with this, but let's get this cleaned off and then we'll put the pen together. All right, so now we can go ahead and assemble our pen. The nice thing about the Junior Zen is there's only two parts you have to press in. We have our end cap, which we'll press into this end. And our writing nib and our top cap. All right, so I'll press those components in there where they're kind of just held in there by a friction fit. And we'll set this into our pen press. Make sure everything's nice and aligned because you don't want those parts going in crooked or else it'll crack the tube. So once you have them kind of in there by hand, the nice thing is this, thing, uh, this is spring-loaded, and then we'll just nice and gently press these into place. And then just snug it down just a bit and make sure everything's seated correctly. Alright, so we've got our pen completed. Hopefully you guys enjoyed the video and learned some new different tips and techniques, turning between centers, how to get your mirror polish, and hopefully you guys enjoyed these new blanks. These are bespoke blanks from Hobble Creek Craftsman. A uh, ton of different options to choose from as far as color variations. Uh, hopefully you guys enjoyed the video, but if you want, leave a comment in the section below and subscribe to our channel for more wood turning videos. <laughs>